Our scripture reading is the ninth commandment of the ten. We're almost there. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What is truth? What is truth? I can hear that question echo throughout Pilate's palace and cascade down the centuries. You'll remember the story, I'm sure, in John chapter 19. You'll remember, I'm sure, that Jesus was in custody and Pilate was trying to figure out what to do with him. Pilate knew all about force and power. He was more of a military man than a politician after all. And he knew that Rome was where his bread was buttered and so he was faced with this challenge of what to do with Jesus. Jesus stood before him surrounded by a bloodthirsty mob who proved to be much more comfortable with the violent insurrectionist Barabbas than they were peaceful Jesus. And yet... When mighty Pilate looked into the face of that man, you get the feeling that he saw something more true, more honest, dare I say, more powerful than he had ever seen in his life. I think in a way the whole world was present that day when Jesus stood before Pilate. And I think in a way it was just Pilate and Jesus. So you are a king, Pilate asked. You're correct, Jesus replied. For this reason I have been born, and for this reason I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And I can almost hear Pilate scoff and say, What is truth? Ironically, earlier in the Gospel of John, Jesus had said, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the truth. And here Pilate looks the truth in his eyes and dares to ask, what is truth? We don't tend to think of truth this way, do we? We tend to think of truth as a thing, an abstract it. For a person to say, I am the truth, It just doesn't compute in the way we think about things. It doesn't fit our epistemological categories. We think truth is based on objective data. It can be verified by what we observe and test and measure. We can put truth in a test tube. We can look it up in primary sources. We can study some statistics and discover the truth. And yet in the midst of our test tubes and our statistics... And our primary sources, there Jesus stands saying, I am the truth. Do you believe that this morning? Seriously in your soul? Do you believe that this morning? If you believe that, that Jesus is the truth, that the truth is a person and not a thing, then you must admit that knowing the truth demands relationship. The world, after all, is more of a communion of subjects than a collection of objects. And to know, to know anything, is to live in relationship. One of my favorite books is called To Know As We Are Known by Parker Palmer. It's a book about education and the way we go about doing education in the Western world. Palmer talks about how in our culture we love to turn education into a competition. That's the first thing we do with education is turn it into a competition. Me against you. When he says education demands community, it demands relationship. In the book, he reminds the reader that the word truth is related to the old Germanic word troth. As in, I pledge thee my troth. Uh, An old uh, marital vow they used to recite. Or you can see the word troth in the word betrothal. In other words, to know the truth is to enter into relationship with it. You can't know a thing from afar. Interestingly, 
Many people today see truth and love as virtues on opposite ends of the spectrum. They sort of compete with one another. I will love you as far as the bounds of my truth will allow me. But the Bible understands truth and love as more friends than enemies. We don't think our way to the truth as much as we love our way to it. Truth isn't just looking for the right facts. It's living in right relationship. I only bring this up today because we're talking about telling the truth. Or not, as the case may be. The ninth commandment reads, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. There is a shift here in the commandments from deeds to words. From sins of the hand to sins of the tongue. Don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, and here, don't bear false witness. Of course, the division between words and deeds is a Western idea. No ancient Hebrew would divide between words and deeds. They saw words as deeds. Words do things. Words have active potential in the world. When Floyd Patterson the old heavyweight champion of the world lay dying. He said to those around his bed, You can hit me, and I won't think much of it, heavyweight champ and all. But you can say something to me, and hurt me very much. Heavyweight champion of the world. You can hit me, and I won't think much of it. But you can say something to me, and hurt me very much. Words have the potential to create worlds or to tear them down. They have the potential to build up. They have the, the potential to do away. They have the potential to incite violence. They have the potential to make peace. With them we can heal and with them we can wound. With them we can inform and teach. With them we can mislead. With them we can exa exalt and with them we can betray. Some people would say, oh, it's just words, it's just talk. But this command would call us to recognize the severity of our speech, the importance of words, and to be wise with how we use our tongues. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Of course, the language of this command insinuates a courtroom setting with the real particular sin being perjury. The damage we can do to someone in a legal setting by not telling the truth about them. Just last week we read the story of Ahab and Jezebel and Naboth in the vineyard. You remember that? You'll remember it was falsehoods in the judicial setting that sent Naboth to his grave. It was the lying which became the midwife of the stealing. The Bible does that a lot, you know. It looks at lying and stealing as twins because they both rob. One robs of material goods and the other robs a person of a good name. It was lies from the mouth of Potiphar's wife which sent Joseph into prison in Egypt. It was lies from the angry mob that sent stones in the direction of Stephen. It was lies from Ananias and Sapphira over their giving to the church, or better said, their withholding, you see, lying and stealing, which sent them suddenly to their death. To be sure, there is a high price for telling the truth. Can we say that today? There is a high price for telling the truth. But the Bible would say there's also a high price for not doing so. While this commandment centers on the courts, it does not end there. The word for false here, as in don't bear false witness, literally means empty or void. It's the same word used in the third commandment, don't take the Lord's name in vain, empty, as if it's nothing. Same word. The idea is that our, way, our words should have enough honesty in them that they're weighty. There's some substance in them, some integrity to them. They should have some contact with reality, some contact with uh, the grounding of truth. Lies are empty words. 
Vacuous language fluttering through the air. No substance, no backbone, no form. They can ooze into the cracks of life and separate one from another, destroying relationships as they inevitably do. Lies can take whatever, whatsoever shape they choose. They are amorphous because they do not care about the grounding of truth. Now we all know, we, we've known since the time we were three years old, that telling the truth is good and right. Some people say it's good and right because it's good for your own health. Others say it gives you peace because then you don't have to remember all your lies and to whom you told them. But let us be sure to notice the last word in this commandment today. Did you notice that? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Neighbor. Telling the truth is a way of loving your neighbor. Lies destroy relationship, but truth builds. You have no community, brothers and sisters, without trust, and you have no trust without truth. It's truth that leads to troth, remember? And in turn, it's a context of troth which leads to more truth. And yet, we live in a day where truth is so very hard to come by. Sometimes, we're afraid to speak the truth, at least any truth that matters, because we really don't know the person with whom we speak. We're afraid that if we really speak from the heart, they'll not be there when we're done. They'll not be there the next day. Even people, dare I say, with whom we've gone to church for years, we're really not close enough to them for deep to call to deep. It's difficult to bear your soul to someone who can't be trusted with the nakedness of it. It's difficult to speak deep truth when all you have are shallow relationships. Can I ask you this morning to think in a profound, honest way about who it is in your life that you can speak truthfully and honestly with? And then think even deeper about why that is so? Why can you tell them the truth? I bet it has something to do with troth. We live in a day where truth-telling seems to be so very lacking. Statistics are bent. Perspectives, individual perspectives are universalized. Half-truths parade as whole truths. People begin with their verdicts and then go looking for the evidence and in so doing manipulate the evidence. And with the rise of all forms of social media, anyone with a keyboard can put out anything into the world with no consequence whatsoever except a great one. There was a day when anything you read in print had to have at least some grounding in some notion of truth. These are no longer those days, brothers and sisters. Logan has taught us as a staff, he's... He knows these things, you know, as a youth minister. It's called clickbait. Think about that. Clickbait. Sensationalized headlines that don't care about the truth, they just care that you click. And after you click, they care that you pass it on and pass it on and pass it on. Clickbait. Brothers and sisters, as people who care about the truth, it is our task to research what we read, to critique what we believe, to be very cautious about what we pass on to other people. We dare not pass on half-truths or untruths. And we dare not reach for the sensationalized simply because it cozies up with our agenda. We dare not caricature other perspectives while demanding a fair hearing of our own. And we dare not continually shout into an echo chamber, which is so easy to do in our culture, and then pretend as if the voice we're hearing is simply telling us the truth. When we do pass on something that is untrue, when we do say something that is untrue, we remedy it as quickly and as surely as we can. And when someone confides a deep truth in us, we honor the truth of their soul. Brothers and sisters, fostering a context of truth-telling isn't just about our tongues, it's about the way we listen to. If I want you to tell me the truth, 
I need to be able to honor your truth. Vice versa should be true as well. We must pay attention to the ethics of our tongue, which according to James is amongst the most powerful parts of our body, though it be small. Like the rudder of a giant ship or the bit in a horse's mouth, the tongue is small, but it has a way of controlling the entirety of our lives. We speak truthfully with the intention of living truthfully because we bear witness to the one who came to bear witness to the truth. We want a congruence with our lives and our tongues just like we want a congruence with our tongues and the truth. In the book I mentioned earlier, To Know As We Are Known, Parker Palmer writes that there are basically three reasons people search for the truth. Three reasons people care about the truth enough to search for it. One is curiosity. It's value neutral. It doesn't really matter. It's sort of ambivalent, shallow. We become curious about a thing and therefore turn our attention to it for a season. The second reason people care about the truth is control. We seek the truth to get our way, to win the argument. These people like to use the truth or better stated, their truth, as a weapon, suppressing any and all alternative voices. Their knowledge makes them smarter, but it does not make them more virtuous. But Parker says there is one more motivation for seeking the truth, one more reason why people would care enough about the truth to go looking for it, and that's love. It is love for the neighbor that compels us to seek the, seek the truth and speak the truth wherever we are and wherever the truth may be found. It is why the Bible compels us to speak the truth in love, presumably because there's no other way to speak it. Those who speak the truth and leave a scorched earth around them everywhere they go are speaking something other than the truth. Brothers and sisters, there is rarely a good time to be brutally honest. But there is always a good time to be lovingly honest. Our trough-full commitments to one another are what motivate us to speak the truth to one another. We seek the truth because we are all following the one who came to bear witness to the truth. And I guess the best way to start bearing witness to the truth is simply telling it best we can. I want you to imagine with me today. Close your eyes if need be. Dream if need be. But I want you to imagine with me just for a moment. Imagine with me in our cacophonous world an oasis of truth. Imagine with me a place where people were free to speak the truth because they really trusted in the troth that bound them together. They knew that they could speak from their heart and the other person wouldn't run in the opposite direction. Nor would they hang their dirty laundry out in public, but they would honor and treasure that truth. Can you imagine? Imagine a place where truth-telling was a way of life. And I don't just mean telling shallow truths, sports and weather, but I mean where, where we speak from the depths of who we are to the depths of who the other person is. Where in moments like these, I know I'm the preacher and I'm the one person speaking in this room today, and I get that. I'm probably more excited about every sermon than you are. But where else in the world does this happen? Think about it. Where else do we go where our souls commune and we think about the things that are most important to us? Where else do we go? Imagine with me a place where people were humble enough to understand the difference between their truth and the truth. And where they refused to crucify other people on the altar of their truth. But where they were willing to die on behalf of the truth. Imagine with me a place where people sought the truth in community, recognizing that none of us sees the whole of it, because God's an awfully big God. 
Imagine a place where alternative voices are welcomed and never silenced. Especially those voices who see life from the fringes and the margins and the depths. The Gospels tell us the fringes and the margins and the depths is where Jesus liked to hang out. If that's true, then that's probably where the truth hangs out too. Imagine with me a place where people put a stop to untruths and half-truths and paranoia because they're empty, vain, vacuous talk and spoke as simply as possible without being simplistic. Imagine with me a place where we sought the truth wherever we could find it because all truth is God's truth. And part of our truth-telling is confessing mystery. It doesn't mean the absence of truth. It means there's more truth than we can comprehend. It's one of the reasons in church we don't just lecture. We sing. We dance. We act. There's mystery in this world that's greater than all of us. There is more truth, brothers and sisters, in honest silence than in speech filled with platitudes and clichés which obscure the truth more than they reveal it. Sometimes the most truthful thing you or I can say is, I do not know. Imagine with me a place where people saw themselves as bound to the truth and not as if the truth was bound to them. Do you know how refreshing a place like that would be? How enlivening, how life-giving, how transformative a place like that would be in our world this week, this day, now. Do you know how transformative that would be? Y'all, I believe when all is said and done, when all the pundits have stopped talking and all the bloggers have stopped blogging and all the preachers have stopped preaching and all the statistics have been interpreted and all the crowds have stopped shouting, the only thing left standing will be the truth. At that point, by that time, it will likely have holes in its hands and feet. But in the end, I believe the only thing left standing will be the truth. If that's where we end up, seems to me as if that's a pretty good place to start. If He came to bear witness to the truth, so do we. And I guess the church exists in large part to answer Pilate's question. What is truth? It takes a community of love, a community of commitment, a community of troth to answer that question. It takes all of us to answer that question. It takes a community. We call that community the church. My hope and prayer is that on that last day when the truth is all that's left, Second Baptist Church will be right there standing with them. Even if we have holes in our hands and feet. Amen. Oh Lord, we lift up to You all that we are today. Life has a way of whittling away at the untruths of our lives. Time does away with the fickle and the fads. History has a way of doing away with all the voices that consume our attention today. And someday, all of this 
will be under the sands of time. Except you. And what is of you. Teach us, O Lord, to bear witness to the truth in how we speak and in how we listen, in how we live and in how we love. Grant us patience and grant us bold speech. Forgive us when we have followed the lies. Forgive us when we have passed on the gossip. When we've become addicted to the vacuums. Set our feet today, O oh Lord, on solid ground. Help us to speak truthfully and to love deeply. To bear witness to the truth as much as we see the truth, and to leave the rest to you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, the one who is our truth. Amen.